um, Senate Bill 1005, an act in, uh, mm -hmm. strengthening the continuing professional education program. Well, uh, we, we don't find anything objectionable in the bill. Uh, in fact, we support the, the bill. Uh, we understand that PRC uh, actually r right now has a continuing uh, um, uh, requires continuing professional education program for our registered uh, professionals. So we support uh, the bill, Your Honor. Um, uh, let's hear from the, the PRC. Uh, Dr. Cueto, uh, are you going to speak uh, on behalf of the whole uh, PRC? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Yes, Mr. Chair. In behalf of the PRC, let me state that the uh, Professional Regulation Commission welcomes the filing of the bill, strengthening the continuing professional education. The CPD is a very important component in the maintenance and enhancement of the competence qualifications, even addressing the gaps that may be identified among entry-level professionals. At the present time, we are involved in the negotiations in the ASEAN-MRA, the Philippine Qualifications Framework Development and Dissemination, the ASEAN Qualifications Reference Framework. The ASEAN-MRA contains a provision spelling out eligibility requirements before a professional from one country can move to another country, and that is to comply with the CPD requirements both of the country of origin and the host country. As far as the Philippine Qualifications Framework is concerned, this has been institutionalized October 2012 with an executive order issued by President Aquino with the following important components, quality assurance, the pathways and equivalencies, international alignment of courses and practice of professions, lifelong learning, credit accumulation and transfer. And we are also participants to the crafting of the ASEAN Qualifications Reference Framework and the chairperson of the task force happens to be Chair Manzala of the PRC. The ASEAN Qualifications Reference Framework is the reference framework for the 10 countries national qualifications framework. So we look at the CPD, which is a broader term than uh, continuing professional education because it addresses uh, the different components like knowledge, skills, values, apply, application of knowledge, the degree of independence, responsibility, accountability, ethical conduct of uh, professionals, which to us is a very important, uh, relevant uh, component of uh, the competencies and qualifications of professionals. So among the CPD activities that uh, we will be Promoting and evaluating will be formal learning, meaning enrolling in uh, courses like uh, masteral or doctorate courses for professionals, non-formal learning and informal learning. There is an academic track by which uh, the professionals will be able to enroll in formal courses, but we also encourage the uh, professional track where experiential learning will also be assessed. So even if... Uh, the person only obtained a bachelor's degree if he has been working as an executive, for example, or CEO of a laboratory or a hospital for 10 to 15 years, the experiential learning will be given credits. As far as quality assurance is concerned, we have rules for screening and approval of CPD providers, and we also screen and approve the CPD programs. So we are heavily involved in the crafting of the CPD for professionals. Then, we also welcome the mandatory requirement for renewal of the PRC IDs, but uh, we emphasize that uh, it's the qualitative component that we are after. We now talk of learning outcomes rather than just the submission of number of units uh, obtained from uh, sitting in lectures, for example, eight hours, and then they get the corresponding units. At the present time, we should be looking at qualitative components, meaning the learning outcomes. So we will be looking at uh, what is learned if they attend or listen to a four-hour lecture in one day. But we also want to assess the learning outcomes 
based on performance and based on practice when they go back to their workplaces. And we will also encourage self-directed learning because uh, it's a position paper in this because uh, we are expanding the CPE to CPD programs which will address all the competencies. Yes, sir. Okay. Expanding, um, expanding the CPD. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I hope you understand the, wi the wisdom of yet to have um, CPEs in, in their uh, respective fields. Uh, do, do you know, uh, Dr. Beto? Uh, there are 46 uh, regulated professions under the authority of the PRC, mm -hmm. and all the 46 boards have uh, CPD councils, mm -hmm. where there is a membership composed of a member of the board, a representative of the accredited professional organization and a representative from the academy. Okay. But, uh, uh, but uh, we have yet to legislate the new uh, professional uh, regulatory laws of, uh, of some or, or most of the professions. Uh, am I correct, uh, Dr. Pueto? You all heard the 46 boards have already their own regulatory laws. Yes, but uh, we have uh, a lot of them pending in our committee. Yes, for the precisely for the uh, updating, uh, because in in the old uh, uh, PRLs you don't have CPEs, right? Yes, Your Honor, we recognize that, Your Honor. Okay, so since we've been uh, trying to, to push individually the updating of, of uh, the PRLs of uh, all of these professions and we have observed one common uh, provision of all these new PRLs would be the CPEs. Hence, we decided to, to push for this separately uh, in case we, we won't be able to push for the uh, professional regulatory law or civil engineering for that matter uh, we can seem to push it because of this issue with the the architects and in, in within the architecture uh, profession there are also controversies but not related to the CPEs hence we decided uh, since uh, I, I believe uh, all these uh, professional organizations understand the need for uh, CPEs and nobody's uh, opposing it, we might as well get that out of the way as a uh, mandatory uh, requirement for all, right? Pending the updating of uh, all these different PRLs. So that's why we came up with, with this. And we, I'm, I'm, I'm glad about the... Uh, the um, new ideas, new concepts that uh, PRC is coming up with that we may take advantage of this opportunity to inject all of those uh, new insights that you have. So uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Cueto. Um, is there any other? Okay. So anything else, Dr. Cueto? No more? We will be coming up with a position paper to be submitted to your okay. committee, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, we will uh, await that uh, position paper. And uh, depending on that, we will know how to proceed with this bill. Should you uh, agree with this, uh, agree that we pursue this bill with modifications, then we'll uh, call for a technical working group uh, meeting so that you can flesh out all the details so that we'll come up with a, a bill that's uh, uh, amenable to the needs of the PRC. Okay? Yes, Sir Arnold. Thank you very much, Sir Arnold. Thank you very much, Dr. Pueto. With that, uh, we suspend the uh, consideration of uh, Senate Bill 1005 pending the position paper of PRC. So, in the meantime, uh, Dr. Cueto, you are uh, excused. Thank you very much. Mm. Okay. Let's now move to Senate Bill 655.
or an act constituting the National Capital Commission for Capital Re Relocation. Um, can we get the um, position of MMD MMDA? But uh, b before that, uh, what time is uh, the invitation extended to MMDA? One. Uh, so what happened? Um, so, Director Faulan, what happened? Um, sorry, um, I'm really sorry, sir, because um, World Bank people came to my office at 12.30. So I I have to attend to them, sir. Because so we're going to have, a, I think there are about international delegates coming to the Metro Manila, into the Philippines for um, June 4. Mm. So we, we, I really have to, I'm really sorry, sir. So, nung pumasok sila, Saka na si Senator Trillanes. Is, is, ano lang naman yun eh. Committee hearing lang. Okay. I really apologize, sir. I'm really mm. sorry. Um, we already okay. talked with the uh, Director Makapili and I was, I know that she's already here. Okay. Kala ko lang kasi na-traffic yung MMDA eh. Uh, when, when the good Senator came, Your Honor, I was just in the bathroom but I was here prior, uh, before 1 p.m. Mm. Okay. So, let's proceed. So, uh, sino mauna sa inyo? Basically, Your Honor, we are of the same position that so, um, we we submit, uh, uh, we recommend for the approval or we, we support the Senate Bill 655 to the effect that, Your Honor, there is really a need to study and recommend whether or not there is a need to transfer or not transfer the, um, the seat of government, Your Honor, considering the current state of Metro Manila we're in. Um, the Metro Manila has already reached its... Um, Carrying capacity, Your Honor. Okay. So, um, do you have any position paper in, in that in that regard? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, actually, the Chairman Tolentino, Chairman Tolentino in 2012 came up with a publish a book entitled A New City, A New Metropolitan Manila, A New Future. So in this book, he recommended already, he actually recognized the need to come up with a new Metro Manila and already made some recommendations. Uh, actually enumerated the reasons why, uh, um, focusing on the max maximum capacity that already been reached for Metro Manila in terms of development, and recognized and recommended some possible areas where we could possibly um, relocate Metro Manila as a capital town, as a capital city, sorry. Okay, so he recommended this to, to whom? In the book that he published, sir, uh, he enumerated some of the possible sites. I'm just not aware if um, the good senator was given a copy, but you're ready to give a co the copy to the good senator, sir. Yes. But uh, I think my, my question is, he published the book, um, and what did he intend to, to achieve by publishing that book? Uh, isn't he part of the executive branch if he really believes strongly about his, uh, uh, his recommendations? Did he uh, push for it in, in Malacanang? Did he actually talk to the president and convince him to to start the the process? As of now, Your Honor, we do not, we do not have we do not have uh, personal knowledge, but we could inquire to the um, to the chairman. It's just out of the country after as of today, Your Honor. Okay. So um, thank you very much, uh, Attorney Ona. Uh, let me acknowledge the presence of uh, our uh, Assistant Minority Leader, Senator Vicente Soto III. Sir, thank you very much for being here. Um, with that, we, we have a call room. Okay. And uh, uh, Attorney Ona, uh, please continue. What are, the, what are your findings? If uh, We're just curious. Your Honor, based on the based on the book which was published by Chairman Tolentino, Your Honor, he um, he specifically says that the Metro Manila um, has already reached its carrying capacity, Your Honor, and then he also um, cited some of the cities or some of the countries which has um, moved their capitals, Your Honor, like Japan, uh, Brazil. Japan, Brazil, Pakistan. Nigeria, Your Honor, as one of the examples to, to um, as precedence, Your Honor, that there were other countries uh, who has moved their capitals, Your Honor, from their former capitals. So, uh, those are the examples, but 
uh, what are his recommendations? Um, one of the cities that he recommended, Your Honor, considering that the current um, uh, capacity of Metro Manila, so whether it's, uh, it's, it's um, maximum capacity, Your Honor, he recommended uh, one of the cities is Tanay. Tanay. Yes. Uh, Your Honor, Tanay, province of Rizal, San Rafael, the province of Bulacan, San Ildefonso, the province of Bulacan, and Doña Remedios, Trinidad, Your Honor. Possible sites for the new city, Your Honor. Uh, it's just some sort of recommendation, okay. part of his um, book, Your Honor. Uh, San Ildefonso, Tanay. Um, Tanay. Province of Rizal, San Rafael, Province of Bulacan, San Ildefonso, the Province of Bulacan, and Doña Remedios, Trinidad, Province of Bulacan, Your Honor. Mm. So uh, these are flatlands, but I think uh, only Tanay has a uh, uh, what's this uh, mountainous or uh, rolling rolling terrain. So what what kind of study did he? Did he do actually? Um, actually, sir, um, the initial locations identified by the chairman were just the uh, initial pass. Looking at the uh, the, the hazard um, vulnerability of this of this area, so mm -hmm. in his book he mentioned that uh, these are just ideal sites, but uh, we have to determine if the area is not prone to the vulnerability of floods, specifically because uh, as we know that Metro Manila is quite flat. So it's uh, more, more or less um, mostly uh, visited by by uh, flooding, even if it's just small amount of rain. So. Okay, kung uh, maganda yung ano mo, uh, drainage system, uh, it, it doesn't matter, di ba? Pero so, w what is his basis for coming up with these recommendations? I'm um, sorry, he actually studied some of the. Uh, countries who have moved their capital to a new area and um, this, this, most of these countries are really um, uh, beset by a lot of urbanization problems. No? Uh, examples uh, that... Um, excuse me, uh, Director. Uh, th that's the need to transfer. Napag-aralan yung uh, need to transfer. Okay, let us assume that we, we agree with the need to transfer. Well, what I'm asking uh, from you is he came up with a list of probable transfer sites. What is his basis for coming up with those uh, uh, yes, Your Honor. sites? Uh, in Tanay, Your Honor, I think one of the factors which uh, why he chose Tanay is because it is located near Metro Manila, which is merely 57 kilometers east of Manila, and it's a home to several natural attractions and resort, Your Honor. But uh, these are just opinions of uh, the chairman, not not really an exhaustive or definitive studies uh, on, on the matter. Yes, Your Honor, that's why we support the current Senate Bill, Your Honor, to have a study mm -hmm. um, and to have a, a conclusive study and mm -hmm. to uh, and for that commission to recommend whether or not there is a need to transfer. That's why we support those, Your Honor, because we really we really think and we are uh, we really believe that there is a need to study whether or not the new city should be relocated, Your Honor. Uh, well, I, I just needed to ask Attorney Ona if uh, probably the MMDA chairman has already commissioned a uh, a group to to study, and uh, we would we would love to 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 hear it. And uh, so for now, it's just he's just stressing the the idea of the need to transfer, and just for everybody to visualize these are the probable sites. Okay, so can can we have a copy of uh, your position paper and uh, and the book uh, for that matter? Mr. Chairman, ah, Senator Soto, please. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. While uh, we're at the topic, uh, in the studies that you are making, this is this a continuing study or uh, you're ready to submit it already? What we are ready to submit, sir, is a copy of the book published by the chairman in 2012. But we commissioned a, um, we're now in the process of doing a long-term green print for Metro Manila but until 2030, and, but still in, uh, it's still ongoing, sir. So, In that case, yes, I think um, the, the bill that the chairman is pushing for is uh, uh, very necessary because I did not hear in, in the chairman's uh, proposal or ideas, I did not hear uh, 
Clark. Um, that is the most practical place to transfer the seat of government. If you're going to transfer the national capital region, I think you should include that in your study. Why? The airport is larger than the NAIA, all three terminals put together. And there's the land area in, uh, is uh, vast. You can house Malacanang there, you can house Congress, and all other industries will follow. And the, the, air, the, the, the key is always the airport. Kaya, ay malapit kasi airport dito sa atin sa Manila, kaya Manila dati. And then the port is uh, over in this side. No? Pero doon, lalapit ang Subic, lalapit ang, ang Clark would be the, the center. I think uh, it's worth it. You should uh, study that possibility also. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Soto. So anyway, uh, uh, again, uh, you are supportive of this uh, bill. So um, we will just uh, uh, invite you again, should there be a need to come up with a technical working group. If not, then uh, uh, we're also looking for your technical uh, expertise. Should we come to a point of... Uh, uh, sponsoring this bill in, in in the floor, okay? So, uh, Senator Soto, if uh, there are no more uh, uh, questions, okay. We will now be suspending the uh, consideration of uh, Senate Bill Number 655, and uh, we can now excuse uh, the MMDA uh, re uh, resource persons. So, mabilis lang naman, Director Faulan, eh. Sana. Okay. Thank you. So, we now move to uh, Senate Bill Number 161, or an act providing the security of tenure, uh, Senate Bill 2040, uh, an act to grant uh, civil service eligibility, Senate Bill 688, uh, the same as uh, Senate Bill 2040. So, um, okay. uh, Director Bonifacio, can we hear your uh, position or the position of the civil service? Okay, um, thank you, Your Honor. So, we take up these uh, three bills all together. Okay. Um, first, our comment on the uh, on the way the SB, Senate Bill 2040 and uh, Senate Bill 688 were worded, or just, just uh, to call your attention on some terminologies. With respect to Senate Bill 2040, um, it says here Section 1 is hereby amend. Section 1 of RA will be deleted because when we talk of uh, Casual or contractual appointments, these are not career positions. Well, uh, first of all, uh, we would like to say that the civil service is mandated to uphold the com through competitive examinations. Mm -hmm. So, if we could have our way, um, uh, we would prefer that um, what should be prioritized are the, grand are the provision of regular positions, regular plantilla positions. So, in short, you are opposing um, the um, uh, Senate Bill 2040 and 688. Uh, our thinking is, um, hindi naman po sila mapapermanent kung wala silang regular position or plantilla position. So, we thought that the first consideration should be to uh, provide regular plantilla okay. items for this casual or contractual appointment. So, uh, if just to refresh the memory of uh, Director Bonifacio, we have tackled the uh, Senate Bill 161, and we came up with this new new term, security of, of tenure, tenure or uh, coterminus position. Oh, yeah. I okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the last Congress, the civil service agreed uh, with this new concept and we passed it here in the Senate and uh, as far as I know 
they they pass it in the in the house. Uh, we, we were able to pass it here, but uh, um, it was somehow blocked in the House of Representatives by the civil service. Okay, and uh, that's why I'm I'm puzzled because uh, we're supposed to be straightforward here. If uh, you agree, then. I'll take it at face value. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, actually, ho, medyo talaga nag-aalanganin din kami uh, with this bill. I, I do remember that at one time, uh, the Honorable uh, Senator mentioned to us that uh, what we could possibly do is give them a permanent status so mm -hmm. that hanggang hindi sila nagre-retire, hanggang mm -hmm. hindi sila nag they resign, then they are in the position. Yeah. But the moment get, they, they get out of the service, then wala na, wala na sila. Opo. Oh. Uh, na, na, yes, I, I do recall we had that discussion before. But I also do remember at one time, napag-usapan din po namin sa commission. Pasensya na po kayo, medyo oh. oh. nag-aalanganin kami kasi like, uh, for example, uh, we, if we wanted to talk about job equity or uh, Naalala ko lang po yung misa nagkaroon kami ng forum with some uh, some people, some, some of them students. We were promoting civil service exams. May nasabi sa amin something like, ah, bigay ko kayo ng bigay ng exam but you're not providing job to those who are eligible. Mm -hmm. Kasi alam nila na year in, uh, right now we give the exams twice a year, so we generate of employees. Oh, hindi pa po na employ even as casual. So parang na na naaalala din po namin yung the, those sector of of our people. So sabi nga namin, ano kaya mag-job sharing? Noon, no. andyan sila, bigay naman natin ng pagkakataon yung mga hindi pa na-employed. Uh, Yun lang po. That, that's our, that's our uh, dilemma. situation okay. po. Dilemma. Oh. Sige. But we do commiserate, commiserate mm -hmm. with the uh, situation of our contractual and casual employees. Then what are you doing about it? Uh, this is actually a solution uh, to, to solve that that dilemma for the contractuals and the casuals. Kasi ganito po yan, ano? we're, we're, promo we're promoting a, a just society, di ba? Uh, we're uh, enforcing labor laws in the private sector. Tapos dito sa public sector, sa nga mga kita, 30 years ng casual. So, pagdating ng bagong boss, he can just say, tanggalin natin yung mga casual. Tapos na. So what happens to that? Uh, ang tendency kasi natin minsan uh, dito sa civil service is to look at these numbers as mere statistics. But these numbers actually uh, represent real people, uh, breadwinners, heads of families. Uh, most of them are in their 40s and 50s who may not be competitive anymore. If you decide to say, let's employ the new ones, you get rid of, of uh, those who have actually served uh, with you or for you all these years. Uh, what will happen to them and their families? They won't be able to, to find a job. I, I'm almost sure of that. So these families, at some point, their children will stop going to school. Um, some children will be forced into prostitution or uh, some illegal activities. So that's the social cost that you have. Okay? So that's why um, in this uh, economic uh, environment that we have, the government should be a uh, primary employer also since the private sector cannot absorb uh, the, the, what was this, the supply of, uh, of labor. So anyway, these people are already being paid annually for the past 20, 30 years. Uh, isn't it but just that they have the benefits of the regular employees, which we are demanding from the private sector after only six months? Right? So, uh, the, the new ones, they won't, there won't be any uh, social displacement. Because if there's no job available in government, they can apply in the private sector. But those who are already working, if you displace them, 
they won't have any any other place to to go to so those are the considerations of of uh, of this bill uh, if you're saying if we want to to uh, promote or to increase uh, employment or for that matter to employ all these new graduates or civil service eligibles then by all means employ them but not at the expense of those who are already working it's not a uh, uh, um, either or situation because uh, I think th there is this um, wrong notion of uh, big government, small government. Uh, some people are promoting a small government so that you'll have uh, less expenses. Yes, that's that's the debate. Those kinds of debates are are reserved for uh, developed countries. In third world countries, again, as I said, if the private sector is not ready to employ, the public sector should be ready to come in and provide employment. So uh, I, I wish the, uh, the civil sector would embrace that uh, ideology. Uh, let, let the finance people worry about uh, providing salaries. Remember, just to cite an example, that's, that's one of the solutions they, they came up with when they had this uh, uh, depression, the Great Depression uh, during the 1930s. The United States actually employed, the government employed the people because the private sector uh, has no absorptive uh, capacity. So by employing them, their economy recovered uh, some, somewhat until the, the private sector um, recovered. So we're not saying that we, we have a uh, depression, uh, uh, depression like situation, but uh, we're a third world country. So hindi tayo nalalayo sa ganun. Okay? Itong ginagawa natin, itong, I agree that the two other bills are different civil service eligibility is different from a plantilla or regular position. Uh, kahit bigyan ka ng civil service eligibility, if there is no uh, plantilla position, wala rin. Kaya nga ito nga ating solution dito is yung security tenure. If you're already a casual there for 10 years, mara-regular ka, pero coterminus. Pag-retire mo, wala na rin yung position mo, hindi na yan mapupunan. So that will take care of your big government, small government dilemma. Di ba? Pero at the same time, inalagaan mo yung empleyado mo kasi nag-serve na sila eh. Sa'yo. Kaya nga binibigyan natin ng ano, ano rin, ng uh, qualification, 5 years or 10 years. Thank you. So, pwede siguro tayong maghagil dito kung um, what would constitute uh, or what would qualify a uh, uh, a casual or a contractual um, from uh, being a, a uh, um, what's this from having a security of tenure okay so pwede tayo maghagel pwede nyong bigyan ng additional uh, uh, requisites but big, bigyan naman natin sila ng option yun lang People, your honor will look into that. Okay, we'll discuss it with our principals. Mm -hmm. Sige, um, uh, ang hirap kasi nagbago naman yung isip nyo. Meron akong position paper nyo no last time, tapos ngayon, di ba? Uh, yun nga uh, po, kasi marami rin pong consideration. Uh, we do understand po the, the, the mm, senator. Mm. Mm. Hindi naman civil service ang bubunot niya ng pasweldo niya ni. Eh. Okay, anyway, um, uh, let, let's, uh, uh, get the position of, of the others. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, Attorney Gatchalian, please. Good afternoon, Your Honor. I'm Attorney Rika Gatchalian, representing the Philippine Government Employees Association. On the bill granting uh, civil service eligibility, the PIGEA is manifesting its strong support. Um, 
the said support has been manifested before the Senate uh, over the past years already. It is observed, however, that the different periods were provided in the bills. There are three, five, seven, and ten. Uh, it is the humble suggestion of our uh, members that the period be set at a minimum of five years because that period is an indication of the merit and fitness of uh, the said employee. And the uh, said employee would not be continually employed by a government agency if they, um, he or she has not uh, passed the appraisal performance test. So. Uh, the other pos uh, position uh, of the PIGEA are also indicated in our position, but that's the major point that we want to uh, communicate with this honorable body, Your Honor. Uh, what, what position are you talking about? Uh, have you submitted your position I, paper? Um, no. I, we're, uh, it's with me right now. Uh, okay. We're going to submit it so, after okay. the so, proceedings. Um, let me just clarify. There are two separate concepts here. Yes. Providing civil service eligibility, and one providing for security of tenure. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, discussed uh, lengthily about the differences between the two. So, um, which one is the uh, PIGEA uh, supporting? Um, we have discussed in our position paper initially about the civil service eligibility. We will submit the, uh, an additional or um, supplemental position paper regarding the um, grant of security of tenure, but based on the previous uh, position papers uh, being submitted by PIGEA before the Senate and the um, Cong House of Representatives, we are supportive of the bill granting security of tenure uh, to these kinds of employee under certain conditions. Your okay. Uh, we, the, in fact, the, it was a civil service commission who educated us about uh, the differences between the two. Because these two bills granting civil service eligibility, even if you'll be granted civil service eligibility after one year, but if there is no plantilla position, then it just it just it would just remain as uh, eligibility. Yes, sure, no. Okay, so uh, it's not connected with uh, whether your uh, yes. So that's why when we refile this, we we um, we change this to security of tenure because I believe that's what uh, that is what the. Uh, contractual employee um, actually craves for, right? He, he would want to have that peace of mind that he will still have that job, uh, his present job, uh, until the day that he retires, or uh, unless, uh, except, of course, uh, he would be removed for cause. Okay? So... Um, I, I think we need to go back to your your members yes, so that uh, these two would be differentiated. Yes, now, sir. as to the years, the number of years, we classified uh, these employees into two. One from the national government agencies and the, the other from local. the local government uh, units. Uh, we set the, the bar at 10 years because as you as you may concede in uh, in the local government units most of the appointees are political and that's why at some point uh, uh, the actual service would suffer because when it's political then no qualification is considered at all now, we set it at 10 years because assuming they'd be in power for nine years for three consecutive terms and then the next administration would, uh, would not uh, be happy with their uh, services, then at least the, the, the state would have that uh, natural screening process. Okay? So... Uh, because you cited earlier that five years would uh, at least determine whether they're competent or not. 
Yes, for as far as for, as far as the national government agencies are concerned, but for the local government units, no, it, it doesn't matter, because uh, if you're a friend of a friend, and that uh, that is a political appointee, so whether uh, you're just sleeping on the job every day, seven days a week, uh, you won't be removed. So it is you cannot readily assume that uh, they have passed whatever bar or standard uh, in, in their workplace. So We take note of your comment, Your Honor. We'll go back to our members to get their position regarding the period uh, that uh, would be recommended in case of local government employees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll have to um, find a common ground. Uh, I understand the the considerations of civil service because uh, they, they want to set a very high standard for the bureaucracy. On the other hand, the uh, the employees, the contractual employees, are already there and uh, they cannot be displaced just uh, because in, in our pursuit of uh, of uh, raising the standards. So we're finding a middle ground here that while we are still a developing country and while they're already there, we might as well uh, treat them like uh, regular employees uh, as some sort of reward for uh, their uh, continuous uh, service, while at the same time not compromising the, um, what's this, the uh, standards of the civil service, right? This should only be a stopgap solution. That's why it is coterminous, meaning no plantilla position will be created, but uh, once you retire, uh, the plantilla po uh, position, uh, that regular position will be collapsed with your retirement. So we're not bloating the bureaucracy, but it's just a stopgap solution for the present crop of of contractual and casual employees. So we have to find a middle ground because we want to pass something that can be passed. We want to push for something that can be passed. Because if the civil service will not agree to this, then uh, uh, th this bill will not go anywhere. And uh, the same way with if uh, we raise the bar too high, you'd be opposing that as well. So I, I wouldn't sponsor this uh, at all. I wouldn't waste my time anymore if uh, it's not going to pass either way. Okay? Uh, so um, for now, uh, let me uh, ask the uh, both the civil service and the PJA to have an open mind about this uh, proposal and uh, how many uh, um, how much time do you do you need uh, to come up with a, uh, a more favorable uh, position paper uh, we'll have a regular commission meeting tomorrow okay. I'll be facing the three members of the commission I will mm -hmm. relay the uh, mm -hmm. honorable senators uh, 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 concerns about the bill pakisabi kay chairman duke legacy ano niya ito huh? <laughs> legacy po, pro Honor. project namin ito Sige okay po. and uh, same with Attorney Gachalian. Yes, Please, kausapin nyo sila. Try to inform them about the differences between the two, secretive tenure and the civil service eligibility. And try to be as flexible as possible. Itong mga casuals na 20 years, 30 years, they're running out of time. At, and as we speak, marami sa kanilang tinatanggal arbitrarily and we cannot do anything about it. So, let's not take too much of... Uh, of uh, let's not take too much time sa yes. pag-ano natin ha? Yes, Your Honor. okay so uh, with that uh, we suspend the consideration of uh, Senate Bill 161 688 and 2040 so uh, the uh, res uh, respective um, resource persons are hereby excused Okay, we now move to uh, the consideration of uh, House Bill 
4123 or the Government Employees Entrepreneurship Development Act. Uh, are you still uh, concerned with this, uh, Attorney Gatchalian? No. Okay. The said bill was not included in the invitation sent to the PGA, Your Honor. Mm, okay. So, uh, but I think it, this concerns government employees as well. But uh, if you feel the need to be excused, uh, you're, you're already excused. Okay. Uh, Director Bonifacio. Yes, Your Honor. Um, we support the bill. In fact, uh, si Chair Dukipo has already sat in one of the discussions on this with the employees group. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's really true, no? Um, our retirees, after serving uh, long years of go in government, sometimes they would engage in business, but since they do not know, they do not have the know-how, then they end up losing their hard-earned money. So we support the objectives of the bill. And we are willing to chair the council. There's mention here about the council on government inter employees entrepreneurship development program. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director Bonifacio. At least nakaisa ako, ah. Next, uh, we move to DTI, Ms. Peña. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Your Honor. Um, the DTI has yet to issue its uh, official position paper on the, the bill, but my agency, the Bureau of Micro, Small, and Medium Enterprise Development, of which uh, is part of uh, DTI, uh, supports the passing of uh, this bill. Um, um, wait, Ms. Peña. This, this was, um, what's this? This came from the, from the House of Representatives. They passed this on, on third reading. Mm -hmm. oh, so okay. I can imagine your office was yeah. consulted mm -hmm. so actually this is the first time your honor that we were time. consulted and uh, we're glad and, and thankful to the uh, committee for okay. uh, involving our agency in mm -hmm. this uh, discussion of this bill okay. um in the comments that we submitted to our um, office of the secretary we cited that uh, with their relatively low compensation as compared to their counterparts in the private sector, uh, government employees usually opt to engage in entrepreneurship activities to supplement their income. However, in the absence of an enabling law that could systematically hone their entrepreneurship skills, the employees are exposed to the high risks attached to operating a business. Uh, programs such as technology transfer systems, entrepreneurial education programs, which our uh, agency can provide actually, uh, are supposed to be provided under this bill and will help hone the entrepreneurial skills and provide more economic opportunities for uh, government employees. Thus, um, the Bureau of um, Micro, Small, and Medium Enterprise Development supports uh, the objectives of this, uh, uh, of this uh, bill. Now, Section 7, uh, we noted, uh, Your Honor, that as, apart from the DTI, um, the Bureau of MSME Development was made a part of the uh, Coordinating Council on uh, Government Employees Entrepreneurship Development Program. Um, we suggest that uh, this med be actually uh, excluded in the membership because it is already a part of DTI. And uh, we figure that if the bill is passed and enacted into law, um, our uh, agency will be assigned actually to be a part okay. of that. So uh, anyway, uh, this bill is not yet uh, set in stone. Um, we will uh, definitely consider your, uh, your proposed amendments. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Peña. And okay, now uh, we move to uh, GSIS. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Thank you. On behalf of the GSIS, we thank the committee for the opportunity to be part of the deliberations of this important piece of legislation. Uh, we pray that we may be allowed more time to submit our official position paper. But in the meantime, Your Honor, let, uh, let me just initially state um, some of the comments of uh, some of the uh, function groups as requested by, the, the, by yours truly. 
uh, your honor, in, uh, according to the risk management office and the, uh, the legal services group of GSIS, um, we only uh, state that as the primary mandate of the GSIS is to ensure the safety, liquidity, interest earnings, and solvency of the social insurance fund, we submit that the proposal under Section 6 of the bill be subject to the rinses and on entrepreneurship should begin at an early, earlier stage of the employee's work life. Notwithstanding this, we also believe in lifelong learning. Entrepreneurship should be founded on sound financial literacy. An employee who is about to retire should weigh the risks and rewards of entering into business ventures using their retirement benefits as capital and without a steady income stream from salaries to fall back on should they fail in business. Thus, our general comment is that should the government embark on this program, it should commence not right before retirement or post-retirement, but prior to retirement. Uh, with that, Your Honor, we just uh, pray again that we be allowed to submit our official uh, position paper on the matter. We have no other um, uh, major opposition to the to the bill. Thank you, uh, Attorney More Monera. You. So uh, we'll we'll await that uh, position paper. Yes, Your Honor. Um, Tess, the Director Orsia, please. Magandang hapon po. Mm. Test the interposes no objection to the intention of the bill. The proposed House bill is actually deserving of everyone's support, given its purpose, subject, however, to some clarifications. First, it is suggested that, the, that a section on definition of terms be included, such that uh, it can easily be understood by the readers, such as Government Service Entrepreneurship Development Program, Technology Transfer System, Entrepreneurial Education Program, Entrepreneurial Networks, Cooperative and Savings, and Loan Associations. Mm -hmm. Duly noted, ma'am. Uh, second, formation of government employees cooperative shall be encouraged in all government agencies and shall be given preferential rights to operate revenue-generating activities. What penalty awaits the employees? if the cooperative they had formed is proven to have interfered with their regular duties? What will be the classification of the pers or personality of this cooperative? Uh, I think the uh, civil service, uh, we, we can come up with uh, some... Uh, was to operate revenue generating activities in available government sites and facilities. What will be the extent of these preferential rights? to be accorded these cooperatives? This question is material because as a rule, whoever wants to join in revenue generating activities in government must pass through the usual bidding process. But then when we say preferential right, it gives an immediate impression of undue advantage. Super Act. Third, um, Section 7 mandates the creation of a cordial double compensation is strictly prohibited under the law to this one. Fourth, it is not clear, however, as to what form of assistance shall be given. Is it financial or training assistance? Assuming an employee retired in 2015, until how many years from date of retirement shall, be assist, shall he be assisted? As to test... Uh, the project needs support of sufficient funds. It, it is uh, appropriate that a section on the House will be inserted to provide appropriations or counterpart funding may also be sought from other funds like LGUs. Thank you, sir. Uh, well, anyway, ma marami hong magandang uh, ano, ideas na kinuha nyo. And uh, is it incorporated in your uh, position paper? Uh, yes. The position paper only said that we interpose no objection. Okay. I can. I, yes, please. Uh, you can help us out. Kung ano yan, yung mga sinasabi nyo concern. And pwede nga natin isama yung TESDA as, uh, uh, as part of the post uh, service um, assistance. Kasi, di ba, para magkaroon sila ng additional skills. So, um, uh, since there are no uh, dissenting uh, opinions and positions, we'll just uh, get the other position papers and we will harmonize this through a, uh, another tech working group meeting. 
And until then, um, thank you very much for uh, coming over. And so the resource persons for House Bill 4123 are hereby excused. Thank you. We now move to uh, the final um, item on the agenda or the uh, for the act granting survivorship benefits to the surviving legitimate spouse of a deceased retired member of the office of the solicitor general so uh, let's hear uh, first from the office of the solicitor general uh, thank you very much uh, senator we were hoping sir to come over today together with the widows of uh, the deceased uh, solicitor, uh, Assistant Solicitors General. Uh, and uh, w w with us today, Your Honor, is Mrs. Esther Andin, the wife of former Assistant Solicitor General Zoilo Andin. Uh, we were hoping... Uh, yes, sir. We were hoping, sir, because we were coordinating with them uh, until the meeting started uh, for Mrs. Estuesta to come over but she was not able to make it back from uh, Albay mm -hmm. and the widow of uh, assassinated Assistant Solicitor General Nestor Ballasilio sir, uh, we are hoping that she, uh, she can still make it because she said she's, uh, she will try to rush her uh, the the Senate bill, sir, under consideration, Senate Bill 1010, is most welcome by the OSG family because uh, it is a benefit that the counterparts of our uh, concerned uh, uh, solicitors, uh, state solicitors, assistant uh, solicitors general uh, have but is denied uh, the said employees of the Office of the Solicitor General. We are, uh, sir, in the process of finalizing our draft uh, uh, comment, hoping that we will be allowed to incorporate and introduce uh, some additional matters, in particular, Your Honor, regarding uh, ex the extension of the benefit not only to the widow of the deceased uh, uh, state solicitor uh, or government uh, or OSG official concerned, but also to their minor dependent children. Uh, there are pending bills, Your Honor, before the lower house and also before uh, this August body proposing this uh, grant of survive survivorship benefits to minor dependent children. Uh, of concerned, gov uh, or con concerned OSG employees and also to those um, who are mentally incapacitated, uh, children who are mentally incapacitated or uh, have a physical defect that make them incapable of supporting themselves. Uh, and, uh, together with this, Your Honor, would be uh, other matters relating to the expansion, to the standards, uh, regarding the retirement benefits of uh, concerned OSG employees to your honor which we hope to incorporate uh, in our co comment which we will be filing shortly okay uh, we would appreciate that uh, attorney Miranda and um, I believe uh, again th this this particular bill was uh, was filed because of the oversight uh, when when the uh, was this RA one zero zero eight four was uh, was enacted and uh, uh, we'll try to make up for that by uh, by pushing forward with this uh, this bill. Uh, l let's hear first from the uh, civil service. Okay, in as much as our colleagues said they would want to make further amendments, um, uh, the CSC comments may be considered. If, if uh, Section 1 says the, the said surviving legitimate spouse shall continue to receive such retirement benefits during his or her lifetime or until he or she remarries. We thought that there, must, there may be some safeguards 
And by analogy, we noted the, con the condition set under RA 9946, an act granting additional retirement, survivorship, and other benefits to the members of the judiciary, amending for the purpose RA 910. And uh, it is along this uh, line, it is suggested that uh, yung, yung mga safeguards, number one, that the surviving legitimate spouse receiving the benefits shall not appear as counsel before any court in any civil case wherein the government or any subdivision or instrumentality thereof is the adverse, adverse party mm -hmm. or in any criminal case wherein an incumbent or former official, officer or employee of the government is accused of an offense committed in relation to his or her office, collect any fee for his or her appearance in any administrative proceedings. And another safeguard that when the surviving legitimate spouse shall assume an elective public office, he or she shall not, upon assumption of office and during his or her term, receive the said benefits. Parang meron din po siyang hmm. limits. So, so we can adopt the same uh, conditions? That's what we suggest okay. to your honor. Okay. okay. Uh, it's fair enough. Uh, anything else, uh, Director Bonifacio? Wala na po, sir. Okay. Uh, I believe uh, b there won't be any, any uh, was this first uh, reaction from the OSG uh, with that uh, input? You're open to that. I can yeah, we, we're open to that. We we will consider. We will include that in our uh, comments, sir. So, uh, can we hear from uh, Mrs. Esther Andin, ma'am? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, ASG, Assistant Solicitor General Andin, uh, retired from the OSG mm -hmm. under the nine one zero retirement. Uh, and that deprived me and the family from any survivorship since he passed away. Mm -hmm. So we now appeal uh, the family. Uh, ay, uh, matutulungan ng ating, oh. uh, Thank oh. you. Thank you, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. We've been working on this since 2011. But, uh, we can have this, uh, Your Honor. Yes, ma'am. Yes. By then, everybody would uh, be ready with their... Uh, uh, proposed amendments so that uh, we can have this thing on the floor uh, hopefully after Congress reopens in uh, July okay with that uh, this uh, committee hearing is hereby adjourned